welcome guys to the webinar today and thanks for joining the Tech Central team. We're very excited for this discussion around debunking the myths in cloud security and bringing out all the truths. We have one of the industry's top vendors here to chat to us and teach us a little bit, Palo Alto. We're very excited and Westcon as well. I think without further ado, I'll hand you over to our moderator, the Tech Central moderator, James, and I will let him take this further with you guys. Thanks, Michelle. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to this afternoon. Beautiful day in Johannesburg. Nice and hot. And summer is definitely here. There's no question. But more importantly, what is here is cybersecurity. So welcome from all the team at Tech Central to a topic that is very, very close to a lot of us in trying to understand and unpack the importance and the implications thereof. You know, cybersecurity is definitely something we all need to be very, very aware of and how our data is protected. But before jumping into that, I actually want to introduce the audience first. On our call today is an eclectic mix of people from all sorts of industries, just to name a few of the different brands that are being represented. We've got some exceptional individuals from Anglo American, Petro SA, Maitland Group, Vodacom, Diageo, Mercantile, Standard Bank, Capitech, and a number of other organizations that I haven't mentioned. But what that does is also illustrates the difference in, in audience who all have something that they're possibly going to learn from today. And that covers in a range of different industries, mining, oil and gas, financial services. There's some legals on the call, telcos, security, government, education. So let's all just see how we take this conversation. But, but I mentioned the audience first, because I think it's really important the audience engage. Raise your hand, feel free to engage, ask questions of either myself or France. And let me introduce France. France is a cybersecurity expert. He's been in this field for at least 20 years. He's been adopting cloud platforms, modernizing the workplace, identifying how to create peace of mind in this chaos, as someone as naive as me on this topic might be, and bringing the digital aspects to life, really bringing the importance of security to organizations and, again, to people like me, to the individual. So France from Prisma, cloud sales specialist, Palo Alto Networks, thank you very much for joining us today. And we really look forward to everything you have to say. And please also introduce us to your colleagues. Thanks, Franz. Thank you very much for that, James. And welcome to the audience. I hope this session is useful to you. Again, you know, as James mentioned, let's keep this as interactive as possible. Anything where you require additional clarity or if you have questions, please feel free to reach out. Now, from our side on the call, I have Gordon Bailey McEwen. He is the solutions architect for Africa for the Palo Alto Prisma cloud technology stack. So he's also an avid learner with regards to cloud technologies, very well versed in the capabilities with cloud, specifically around the conversation we're having today around cloud native application security, you know, and some of the trends, standards, and, and best practices that we're seeing. And in addition to that, we also have Brendan McCarran on the call. He is our vendor manager with Westcon, our key distributor in the region. And I'm free to take any questions with regards to the team at any time at the end of the call. Thank you. Thanks, Franz. Franz, can we start with something really, really basic? Sure. What is cloud security? Okay. So essentially, you know, we have paradigms with regards to how security operated in the past with, as I like to call it, legacy infrastructure, where, you know, we would have this typical approach of having a castle moat architecture where we would have a trusted zone within our network space. So anybody that's within our perimeter past our firewalls and our IPSs and those technologies are deemed to be trusted individuals and are able to access you know, resources within our network environment. Now, as it pertains to cloud, the, the architectures, the concepts are very different from what we understand from legacy and, and traditional security methodologies. So what we're seeing is, you know, because you don't have a single egress and ingress into the environment, you know, there's multiple ways you can access those cloud environments. It becomes extremely challenging to implement security. Now, when we talk about cloud security, we're talking about how do we actually protect the resources that are configured within cloud environments? And we can touch on the shared responsibility model to give some more context around that. So how do we configure resources in a secure fashion in the cloud? You know, how do we manage identities in the cloud? Because if you think of the way cloud is constructed, your access to any environment is essentially going to be dictated by your identity and your permissions associated with that identity. So identity becomes a very key consideration from a security standpoint. Furthermore, very similar to traditional networks, you also have the networking component that you need to secure in terms of managing communication flows from point A to point B or segment A to segment B. 
And then ultimately, on top of that, we're working with various applications and compute form factors, you know, so long gone are the days of just using bare metal servers and, and virtual machines for doing calculations on computations and delivering applications. We now look at things like containerized services, microservice architectures, containerized platform services, serverless capabilities, and all of these modernized workloads require different and new ways of securing those infrastructures. So this is also a very key consideration because if we look at the, the structure of cloud, there's this concept called the shared responsibility model. Now, in essence, the cloud service provider, whether that be AWS, Azure, GCP, Oracle, Alibaba, you name them, you pick them, they will take care of the infrastructure that they provide you to host your services on. So that's part of the shared responsibility model. There's a shared responsibility in terms of securing and managing that infrastructure. The service provider will manage the security of the cloud, but you need to manage security in the cloud. So moreover, in essence, the service providers will ensure that their architecture is secure, their access control is in place, but you still are responsible for the resources on top of that. Got you. That makes a lot of sense because as you use the example of a castle and a moat, you know, the castle has lots of moving parts to it. And I think what you're really describing is, you know, someone has provided the castle, but those that are using the castle need to provide their own soldiers on the ground or weaponry, perhaps. Exactly. Is that, is that the analogy? That castle. That's, a, that's a good analogy. Yes, James. Okay. Franz, can I just stop you for a second? You talk about resources in the cloud. Can you just define that a little bit more simply for me? Yes, of course. So when we talk about resources in the cloud, this can be anything from a, you know, a server or a virtual machine in the cloud on which you would load potential software operating system and applications. It could be things like your communication path. It could be things like your storage or even potentially things like capabilities delivered by that cloud provider in the form of various services, like, for instance, Route 53 as a DNS service in AWS or Azure Sentinel as a SOC capability within Azure. So there's a bunch of different capabilities that are deemed to be resources in the cloud. And in essence, you know, they're delivered in different ways. So some of them will be delivered as a platform where you just have access to the capabilities, but some of them will be delivered as infrastructure where you will then have the capability of making amendments and changes to that infrastructure, which would also have to be secure, of course. Okay, so it's not just data. It's not just a list of It's not just databases. Data. 100%. Yeah. The interesting thing, and I think the key difference between, you know, how we approach traditional workloads and legacy infrastructure versus cloud is, cloud is all API based, right? So when you talk about provisioning a VM, you're actually using API calls and your interpretation of a VM is just an abstraction layer through API that provides you with that information, right? The same for your network configurations your resources, your services, all of it is essentially API driven in the cloud, which you know, poses a set of different challenges to what we're used to from securing our perimeters and our traditional networks. Okay, and why has cloud adoption become so prevalent of recent? Well, I think that's a very good question, James. I think, you know, I remember many years ago, and I don't want to give away my age here, but, you know, I was advocating cloud long ago. And Every single organization I dealt with would inevitably turn around and say, there's not a chance we're touching this with a 10 foot pole. You know, various concerns around security, various concerns around operation, you know, control, skills, those sort of things. Exactly. All those capabilities were still very new and we didn't quite have the skill or the understanding of how to manage these infrastructures. But, you know, moving down the line, organizations have opened up to it. I think part and parcel, a key accelerating driver for cloud adoption has been, you know, the pandemic that hit us. There's been a lot of changes in terms of how organizations operate. You know, think about the mobile workforce or the distributed workforce, where the initial approach was essentially, okay, well, we'll open up VPNs to our network. But then because we only had a single egress, that became extremely challenging from a performance and sustainability point of view. So then organizations started looking at, well, you know, if people are working from home, we need to build infrastructure and resources. Why don't we do it on the cloud? Because we don't physically have to be there to do that. We could do that all remotely, which, you know, added a lot of capability and a more drastic acceleration towards the cloud. I think some of the other inherent benefits of cloud and the reason organizations are adopting it is the first one is you don't need infrastructure, right? So if you think about timelines and you want to deliver a service, you know, as a legacy consumer of technology, you would have to phone your Dells and your, you know, service providers and buy the hardware. You have to wait for shipping, delivery. Once it's delivered, you have to prep it, install the operating system. 
and it's a slow, cumbersome process. Not to mention the air conditioning and all those other things that go with it. Exactly, so, electric. So that cost. is to that talks about the structured of, of serverware in your office environment. Are there different types of cloud? Yes. So, well, there's different service delivery models on top of cloud, right? And each of the cloud providers essentially have their own underlying delivery mechanism in terms of the APIs they use for cloud. But in essence, when we think about cloud, we think about it predominantly in a couple of flavors, right? So either infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, or essentially software as a service, right? So software as a service, obviously, it's just, I want this key capability. You log into a portal, you get that capability. Examples are things like, you know, Dropbox to a certain degree, aspects of Salesforce. Then platform as a service is a broader set of capabilities delivered as a platform on the cloud. And finally, infrastructure as a service is more akin to what we understand as part of our, you know, our historic approach to IT, where, well, there's the hardware, let's load VMs or container platforms on there, and let's run our infrastructure in that fashion. And perhaps a hybrid of the two or the variations oh, yeah. of them? Yeah. Definitely. So organizations have the capability of selecting cloud providers based on numerous criteria, right? So what is the cost? What are the capabilities, redundancy, flexibility? terms and conditions and standards, et cetera. But organizations typically, you know, in my experience of dealing with companies locally, as well as what my counterparts abroad tell me, you know, start off on a single cloud journey and then move over to multi-cloud, i.e. consuming multiple cloud provider infrastructure with a take on hybrid cloud as well, where there's a potential of having your own private cloud environment within your data center and then merging that with the public cloud provider environments to have a hybrid approach where you're consuming public cloud as well as private cloud. Okay, there's a, there's a lot to understand here. Franz, you're definitely one of those people who, you know, you speak fast, but your brain works faster. There's a, there's a hell of a lot to get out of you, and let's make best use of this time. One of the questions that's just come through is a question around a, sort of a, a go forward or a strategy around quantum security. What does that mean? Okay. So one of the key things with regards to industry trends, I mean, we're looking at a lot of development in terms of quantum computing, artificial intelligence, and so forth. But specifically with quantum computing, there's a key challenge in terms of cryptography. So when we look at cryptography, essentially what we're doing is we're creating a secure method of communication by randomizing bits of zeros and ones linearly, and then requiring multiple computational cycles to occur on top of that, to try and decrypt it. So the longer your key length, so take a 2048 bit key or a 4096 bit key, the longer the key length, the more difficult it is to decrypt because our binary systems can only communicate in concepts of one or zero. Now with quantum computing, that changes drastically in the sense that a quantum computer can you know, hold superposition. So it can hold a zero and a one at any given time. So as a result, any cryptographic key we have in place currently will be decrypted within one computational cycle on a quantum computer. And that's created a lot of challenge for the organizations of today considering the security challenges of tomorrow. Fortunately, I know there are a couple of companies that are working on this, creating things like cryptographic cube, computational algorithms that will allow them to secure these cryptographic keys from quantum computer states. This is still very much in its beginner or infant stage, but I think there's going to be a lot of advances in that space within the next year or two, as we see the computational power of quantum computers increase drastically. I don't know if that is, is exactly what the, the listener was querying about specifically around cryptography, or if there's a more specific use case or comment that well, he was alluding to. I, th I think what you really answered is the fact that we are looking ahead and there is strategy to, around quantum security. Thanks for defining that. I've definitely learned something there myself. What I'd also like to understand is if we are looking at the way in which cloud has been used recently, there's been a change of working environment, there's been a change of expectation of, of customers. What are some of the key trends that you've picked up lately in terms of cloud and cloud security? I think many organizations approach it very differently. Um, from the onset, many companies try and apply the same principles that they do with on-prem security and sort of create a, a mechanism of portability to take that to the cloud. But fundamentally, the trends that we're seeing is very different from what we experience with on-site. So in the South African context, you know, a lot of the customers I deal with are already on this journey or quite far along this journey. Some are just starting up, but the consensus is within the next 24 months, you know, organizations will have a very steady footing within multi-cloud environments, but more from a hybrid cloud approach. So organizations aren't really looking at relinquishing that on-site capability necessarily, 
but they want to augment that with cloud native capabilities. Okay. In conjunction with this cross adoption of cloud, we're also seeing a change in the compute form factors being used. So bare metal and VMs year on year is reducing exponentially versus the utilization of compute services like Kubernetes, you know, containers, microservices. And interestingly enough, serverless has increased on the rise from even containers and container environments. So that's one of the things I'm seeing, a lot more container adoption, a lot more serverless adoption, a lot less bare metal, a lot less VM across multi and hybrid cloud environments. One of the other trends, and this is in line with, you know, from a security standpoint, trying to apply old school principles is because we're now looking at things like container services, which are ephemeral in nature, it's not like a piece of hardware, it's something that's mm. very fleeting or could be very fleeting depending on how you implement it. You know, your typical security solutions don't work very well in terms of securing those environments. Now with organizations that still have the bare metal infrastructure with the virtual machines trying to adopt these capabilities, this has become quite challenging because now they've got this heterogeneous compute environment where they're trying to, you know, use a single consistent technology stack, which whether per, by perception or technology is, is not possible in the organization. And this creates a lot of complexity indicating or causing more tools to be used. So more technology sprawl, more security sprawl. So as a result of that, we're seeing a lot of organizations talk to us about vendor consolidation. You know, how do we get more from a single vendor relationship without having to operationalize all the different skills internally, you know, pay all these different vendors costs with different, you know, yearly renewal dates. So consolidation is a very, very big thing that we're seeing in the environment. Because of the adoption of containers, one of the other things that we're also seeing is organizations are aggressively adopting strategies that include infrastructure as code within their application delivery mechanism. And in conjunction with this, also leveraging automated security within their CI CD pipelines and DevOps capabilities for those companies. So we can delve into those concepts in a little bit more detail if you want. One of the other things is, you know, from a perimeter point of view or the technology and security of yesterday, we typically siloed or compartmentalized the services we delivered. So you'd have your IT, your risk and compliance, you'd have your dev team, your infrastructure team, your ops team. And we're seeing those lines blur quite a lot. So organizations are shifting more towards a outcome-based approach with the various stakeholders associated within business units, rather than having discrete business units with the attitude of, okay, well, not my problem, let's throw it over the wall. You know, it's a much more integrated approach around that. And then finally, one of the other uh, approaches that we're seeing organizations adopt quite aggressively is, well, because of the way cloud works, we've got different delivery systems and mechanisms into cloud that are a lot more agile than, you know, buying a server, installing the software, loading an application and taking it to production. So security across the entire life cycle, not only in production, becomes extremely important to organizations and a lot more customers are asking for this capability. Okay, thanks. And that really... It answers some of the question, but I think there's more to it that you might want to elaborate on. And maybe there's a checklist you would typically talk to a customer about. But I've got an interesting question here in the chat from Ntokum Tsweni from AXA. And her question, big one, I'm assuming it's a she, might not be. What are the key critical capabilities that I'll need to consider for cloud web applications and API protection for protecting my public facing services? Right, good question. So when it comes to the cloud continuum, right, there's two aspects to this answer. The first one is around the actual cloud delivered application aspect of it. And the second one will cover specifically the web um, API aspect of it. So as a cloud delivered application, there's a couple of things that you can actually do as a checklist just for base security, right? So mm-hmm. from a configuration perspective, the infrastructure hosting that web application, so whether that's you know a VM hosting an app, or a container-based approach, you want to understand the configuration of that asset in the cloud, and you want to be able to link that configuration to a list of known good and bad practices. So this is typically freely available in the form of things like the CIS benchmarks for the various cloud providers and so forth. And this is essentially a hardening exercise so that you can ensure that your infrastructure is hardened from potential breaches for lateral movement in the environment and so forth. So that's the first aspect of it. The second aspect of it now looking at the application infrastructure is from a dependencies, libraries, operating system perspective, you want to make sure that there's no excessive vulnerabilities or exploitable vulnerabilities if there are fixes for those vulnerabilities available. So that's moving up the stack. The next thing that I think is extremely important from a web app and API security perspective is 
obviously you want to be fronting that application in some way with a technology that has security capability and typically what we recommend here is the use of something like a web application firewall or some sort of an api security mechanism and these typically need to conform to firstly your OWASP top 10 so it needs to have comprehensive coverage for your open web application standards security protocols and so forth and in addition to that, you need things like access control. So you need to be able to identify the users. You need to be able to authenticate them, authorize them potentially with multi-factor authentication, depending mm -hmm. on the nature of that application, because this is obviously not something you'd want to do with your clients, but for internal stuff, you want to be looking at things like denial of service protection. You want to ensure that the web service is delivered with TLS at least. So it is secured and encrypted. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that you're providing botnet coverage for that environment. And then from an API security perspective, obviously you want to make sure that the API source destination pairs are vetted firstly. And secondly, wow. you want to inspect those API queries for normality. So how does this API query compare to other API queries that I've received in the past, highlighting potential anomalous capabilities? There's a bunch of additional things you can also do in conjunction with that, but I think those are, you know, at a bare minimum, the basics that you should be addressing. I hope that- And I, that I, and, and I would come to you to ask those questions. 100%, 100%. And, and will I get the hardware and the software from you? Yeah, so in essence, what we do with Prisma Cloud is we are not really concerned about the hardware aspect. We don't deliver any hardware. Okay. We just provide our customers with the capability of protecting their digital transformation journey from cloud to, code to cloud, irrespective of the platform they're using, the cloud applications they're consuming, or whether they're running single multi or hybrid cloud environments. So that's the key around it, but also your yeah, web application protection, API security, vulnerability management, all of that is also included within the tech stack. And I'd be more than happy to have a conversation around this at some point with anybody who'd be interested to listen. Thanks, Francis. It, it, it sounds like there's a bit of a needs analysis conversation that would happen between yourself and the potential customer to really unpack the, the basics of what's in place currently, do a, a bit of risk assessment, and then identify what those needs might be going forward, which I assume are scalable and something that you would guide people on that journey to discovery to implementation? Exactly, exactly. I mean, you know, as a cloud native security vendor, we are fortunate that we get exposed to a lot of customers that, you know, are either far advanced on the cloud journey or starting out or somewhere in between. So, you know, we like to take a consultative approach in terms of how we engage in the marketplace. And we understand a lot of what's happening specifically in South Africa is still very much at the infant phases of cloud adoption and you know having cloud security as an afterthought is obviously not the right approach but it is a challenging thing to sometimes get your head around because it is very different from what we've experienced with traditional on-site technology approaches okay thank you sure but how would you autonomously block malicious activities in the cloud for example an attacker managed to ex manages to expose a zero day vulnerability in your cloud environment how do you autonomously block that malicious activity? So there's a couple of approaches you can take, right? Obviously, the first approach is typically when we look at how applications are delivered, and I'm, re I'm referring now to potentially, depending on where you are in your cloud journey, maybe a future state. But as I mentioned, as part of the trends we're seeing, a lot of organizations are utilizing infrastructures, code, and DevOps to deliver applications into production. Okay. Now, one of the key things we would recommend is obviously injecting security within the development process to ensure that those type of vulnerabilities do not occur within your production environment, right? So that's the first aspect of it. The second aspect is also that vulnerability, even if it's exploitable potentially, and it is a high severity vulnerability, if it's in a cloud environment and it has an attack vector that I don't utilize, then it's not really important to me. But from a real-time protection point of view, there's multiple ways that we can address that, right? So from a workload perspective, you could look at hardening that infrastructure. You could look at providing malware scanning capabilities for that infrastructure, which is slightly more challenging when you look at container environments. We have to look at things like, you know, do I do side loading of that content to do point in time scans? How do I get that real time capability? And our approach here is, in essence, we would typically automatically deploy defenders within the environment. So if you have, for instance, a Kubernetes environment, we would deploy mm -hmm. on the node and automatically scale to protect all the resources there. And as part of that, you know, we will obviously block communication that's not in line with the expected behavior. So we would analyze, and these are typical best practices, right? The hardening of applications in production. So analysis of the network communication, 
file system communication as well as processes that run on that application when it's running normally. And then outside of those processes, applications and network activity, you lock everything down. So nothing can communicate with that instance outside of its intended behavior. And then strengthening that further with malware scanning capabilities, zero day scanning capabilities, crypto jacking ransomware capabilities, so, and then doing a bunch of clever things around, you know, look at, for instance, in a container environment at your Kubernetes admissions, at your access control in that environment. And key to this also is identity, right? So obviously identity is the new perimeter as it pertains to cloud. So if you have a clear strategy and approach to implementing least privileged access, it also further reduces the possibility of these things happening. The final thing I want to mention with regards to that is the use of segmentation, right? Uh, you can implement segmentation capabilities to align better to zero trust within the cloud. And this will allow users that you know somehow gain access to the environment not to be able to move laterally and so forth so there's a bunch of ways that you can approach it and it would be specific to okay. your cloud implementation it sounds like the sort of thing i would want to do by myself <laughs> Definitely Fine, so not. we talk about native applications if i'm a consumer who owns and manages and runs my product through a native application where does that sit and what vulnerabilities is it exposed to Okay, so I think in context of this conversation, when we talk about cloud native applications, it's obviously an application that's hosted within a cloud environment, but that's not strictly the definition. If you look at the definition of a cloud native application, it's essentially an elastic portable microservice architecture, which is deployed through an agile DevOps process. Now, I know that sounds like a mouthful and we can unpack that slightly, but there is a slight caveat to that, right? I can have a cloud native application that's hosted in a private data center on a Kubernetes cluster, as an example, because if I have a private cloud, that same methodology using agile DevOps processes with micro architectures, micro segmentation or micro architectures could be implemented in a private data center as well, right? So okay. locality of that is dependent on the cloud provider that you use. And in terms of just the way these architectures work, if we're talking about you know, microservice architectures, we're talking about things like Docker, Container, Kubernetes, those sort of things, or as a platform, AKS, EKS, and so forth. Now, the way these applications are built are typically by infrastructure as code templates. So an infrastructure as code template is a means of templatizing the deployment of infrastructure in conjunction with an application into production. And there are many open repositories, you know, like Docker Hub, like GitLab, sure. where you can go and download specific packages for web services and whatever capabilities you want to host on your container environment. And you can also do embedding of multiple images inside images to create different layers within your infrastructure as code templates. Now, the challenge with this is, well, firstly, the benefit is as a developer, I can now go and deploy my application, you know, from code to production only using templates and programming. I don't have to worry about infrastructure and hardware. And I can also go and deploy the virtual networking, the storage, all those associated components with it. The challenge is the underlying packages that I may use to do that are typically from public repositories where we don't have any idea who built it, who created it. So open source is awesome in the sense that everybody gets to contribute, but not everybody is verifying that there should be a trust. I mean, you could upload an image that's been you know, put into that repository from a known APT and you wouldn't have a clue. So as a result, what we're seeing is that within organizations, when they deploy these infrastructure as code templates through to applications and containers, mm. there's a lot of inherent vulnerabilities associated with them. And these things need to be scanned and fixed before they go into production. Otherwise, obviously, you're opening up your attack service for exploitability. I mean, we have a research unit called Unit 42 who conducted an open analysis of the public repositories out there. And it was shocking to find that, you know, 63% of the third party code identified had known vulnerabilities in it. 90% plus of the containers identified in the pre built images within those repositories had high and critical severity vulnerabilities associated with it. Okay. Now, think about it from this perspective. If I have an organization that's essentially developer led, so the developers own the keys to the castle. I'm enabling them to use all this modern technology like infrastructure as code, containerized services. Mm -hmm. And I've got a hundred of these developers. I potentially will have two or three security staff. And that's typically the ratio within any organization. Okay. So hundred developers using insecure deployments into production. Guess what the impact is going to be on your security staff? 
they're going to burn up from alert fatigue yeah. and they're going to introduce risk. And that's why you talked about it earlier, but the development teams, well, however they choose to be delivering that development piece, isn't necessarily just sitting and throwing work over the wall. There's actually, a, a, I think you call it DevSecOps team structure. How does that work in ensuring there isn't that Chinese wall between the different development parts okay, of the great. product? Great question. So yeah, I think just to take a quick step back, you know, we, we went from these monolithic applications released in batches and a waterfall approach, you know, so long, slow development cycles on the development side. And then as soon as they finish the development, they throw it over the wall to operations and they have to go and install it on a server. But then there's issues with dependencies and so forth. So that led to the rise of DevOps, in essence, where, you know, there's more of an alignment between these business units. So a lot more, you know, people in process rather than necessarily only technology. And DevOps is obviously then the practice of, or the framework of adopting development principles and infrastructure deployment principles. But when we talk about DevSecOps, we're essentially talking about how do we secure this? Because, you know, as I mentioned in the previous comment, apologies, if I'm writing applications at the speed of dev and I've got more developers than security staff in my organization, my security staff are slowly going to start drowning in the alerts that they're going to receive from vulnerabilities and stuff in the environment. So the modern thinking and modern approach to that is, well, instead of having this cycle where my developer goes on a sprint, releases an application or a usable application, it has vulnerabilities, security operations, then go back to dev and say, hold on, stop what you're doing, go back to that old project, fix your code, and then you can carry on. It creates a lot of frustration. Security can't keep up. It disrupts your development team, leading to reduced agility in terms of bringing your products to the market. So the idea with DevSecOps is how do we remove this friction from a developer point of view without hindering the organization from a risk perspective and reduce security? And the answer to this is fairly simple. Well, the first one is we need to have a, an environment where our security teams can speak a little bit more dev, our developers understand and are a little bit more security savvy. But from a DevSecOps perspective, what we're trying to do is we're trying to automate as much of the security within the actual DevOps process. So within the IDE, so the development environments, within the repositories, as they're pushing code to this repositories or doing pull requests within the CI CD pipeline, by creating multiple guardrails within these environments where you give the developers context and feedback around what they need to do to fix their code there and then, you have a much higher adoption rate in terms of the willingness to fix the problem. And you have a lot less frustration from a development perspective because they're not forced to revisit old projects and old sprints over and over again. So it makes the development process a lot more efficient and streamlined. And then from a security operations point of view, because I'm doing all the checks within the development process, as soon as this application comes to production, mm. well, at least for the time being, it is very clean. So from a security perspective, it's much easier to manage. The other aspect of this whole DevSecOps thing is security in, in all the organizations that I deal with typically are very, very uneasy with what's happening on the dev side of the fence, right? Because they don't have visibility in terms of the processes, what they're taking into production. And very often security is an afterthought or has been in the past an afterthought. So by having this capability where you can now inject security within your development process, it gives security practitioners visibility of what's happening from a development perspective in their own tooling without having to, you know, look over their shoulders and play big brother, which I think is a great approach. Okay. You've actually started answering a question that I keep thinking about is if I was trying to deliver a piece of product into a secure environment, where would I start in building my team? Would I have a number of dev teams and then a security team? Would I have compliance? Would I have brand? Who would I bring into that environment? And one of the questions that's been asked here, if you don't mind me reading it, no. is how does infrastructure as code fit into DevSecOps as you've just described it? Okay, so that's a very good question. So in essence, with infrastructure as code, obviously you're going to be using those templates to produce your application into production, right? Okay. So that template will be used to derive the underlying infrastructure, which obviously will have its own inherent vulnerabilities and challenges associated with it. So within your DevOps processes or within more advanced DevSecOps processes, one of the key things you want to be doing is you want to be scanning infrastructure as code. You want to make sure that you're not only scanning the template itself, but also the dependencies referenced in that template, the other images and packages, the libraries that you're downloading, because all of these could have potential inherent insecurities or vulnerabilities associated with them, or even potential malware. So 
The infrastructure as code has become a key integral part in terms of the delivery through the DevOps process. But in terms of DevSecOps, we want to make sure as one of the core capabilities that we're scanning infrastructure as code to alleviate those operational issues from a SecOps perspective and alert fatigue and to ensure that we're bringing clean code into production. Because I mean, if you go into any environment that use public repositories to you know, identify dependencies for an infrastructure as code template, chances are you're introducing vulnerabilities with every iteration of code into production. I don't know okay, if that so it, it does to an extent that it says you need to be thinking about security on day one. Exactly. As it pertains to cloud, security cannot be an afterthought. Security has to be job zero. It has to be part of your, of your plan, of your strategy, of your execution at every step of the way. You know, taking the case of DevOps, very often organizations take the approach of, right, we've written the code, we've gone through the CI CD pipeline, we're now going into our test environment or our UAT, here we'll do some testing and then in production we'll do a pen test. That's not the correct approach to take with cloud. And the reason for that is cloud is so agile, it changes so rapidly. And, you know, when you start looking at infrastructure as code containerized environments, this is ephemeral. And a lot of the, the, the approaches people take to that is, well, they want it to be immutable infrastructure. So it's not like a server where if there's a patch, I can go and just install that patch on it. The approach with immutable infrastructure, which is typically the correct way of handling container environments, is I'm going to change the infrastructure as code template, and I'm going to redeploy it into production where it's not vulnerable. Okay, so that's very important. Got you. Where do we start this conversation? What if I'm halfway through the process and I'm concerned that I haven't quite assessed my security needs as well as I should have? Where do I start? You just start building again with the correct security check. So I think the, the key takeaway here is when you look at the core capabilities that are required for, in my perspective, my humble opinion, for secure DevSecOps, the first thing you want to be doing is, you know, at dev time, you want to be giving feedback to your developers in the native tooling with regards to potential vulnerabilities that they're introducing into their applications, right? So that's point one. You want to be doing static code analysis, right? Static application security testing okay. is another key factor that you want to be doing. And then as it progresses through the pipeline, you want to be doing things like scanning the infrastructure's code templates, scanning your repositories continuously to make sure that they are still aligned with best practices and that there aren't any newly discovered vulnerabilities introduced in that environment. You want that's to be all scanning. All, that, that's all automated, sorry to interrupt. Oh, yes, yeah, that cannot be a manual process. It's, it's okay. just too time intensive. So all of, all of what I'm discussing now should be automated and baked within your CI CD pipeline. Okay. You know, then in conjunction with that, you also want to be looking at your dynamic application security testing capabilities, your software composition analysis capabilities. Within the DevOps pipeline, you want to be rescanning those images and infrastructure as code capabilities, not only for vulnerabilities and compliance issues, but also for potential malware zero days and so forth. And then obviously, this leads up to production. Now, in production, you now will have a clean application but that may change over time as we discover new vulnerabilities or as things change. And typically, you know, organizations talk about shifting left. I think you should shift left, but stay right at the same time, because even though you're clearing the way for applications to be put into production in a hygienic fashion, things can change. And in production, you also want that control and that security, right? So it still remains very important to have both aspects of that chain covered. So I just unpack that word again, shift left. Yeah, so shift left uh, implies essentially instead of only thinking about things in production, you're going into the supply chain of software coming into production. So you're injecting security guardrails within the processes that are essential to DevOps taking applications into production. Okay, thank you. That's an interesting so, term. I've got, I've got some terms here that I wanted to chat to you about, but it appears you've touched on all of them. But I've got a question here as well, if you don't mind me reading from it. The cloud uses permissions to try to identify extensively how do you go about securing identity in the cloud? There's a couple of approaches and a couple of schools of thought around that. I think the first step is visibility, right? So you cannot control what you cannot see and you cannot secure what you cannot see. So the first step for me is gain visibility into permissions, into your identities, into the resources. Very often when we look at common Active Directory use cases, it is slightly different to how identities are approached in the cloud. Because in the cloud, you have something called a net effective permission, which is associated with you know, some sort of an output. Now, 
you may have a policy that gives you permission to resource X or resource Y on a certain VPC or a certain network set, whatever the case may be. But in essence, you need to understand how these permissions are being used or not being used. Because if you understand how these permissions are being used, you can identify where they're overly permissive and you can reduce that right on that permission. And secondly, from a resource perspective, you then can also identify what permissions are allocated to a resource in the cloud where an identity shouldn't have access to it. So if I have access to server X, but I haven't accessed server X in 90 or 121 days or 120 days, is it actually important for me to have that right? Is it something that is business applicable for me? Sure. The other aspect of that is, you know, over and above the visibility component of it and being able to, in cloud definitions, identify the net effective permission, which is quite complicated. It's quite a couple of steps that you have to go through. So it's not something that, you know, you could easily do in human terms very quickly. Is the use of things like privileged access, multi-factor authentication to secure services and access to, to resources, I suppose, from an API perspective, only for service accounts, only allocating the correct permission in terms of being able to read and write data, but not do API query requests or API push requests. I think those are some of the key capabilities. And then obviously using various tooling to harden down on that identity and identity usage and exposure. I think user behavior analytics also plays a fair role here in the sense that you want to be able to identify the identities that are using or accessing resources that aren't generally the behavior of that identity, right? Because that could also quickly highlight potential risks and issues. I've got two other questions. The first one is, and thank you for the listeners who are posing these questions. They're very insightful. They're, they're keeping me thinking over as quickly as you are. How do I secure my cloud environment if I'm using more than one public cloud vendor and they have different tools? For example, Azure or Amazon Web Services. That is a great question. And the reason I say that is I've been evangelizing this for a couple of years now. And what you'll find is within each of the cloud providers, you've got a disparate set of tools from a security standpoint, which is arguably you know, good enough. But in essence, they have different tools that cover different aspects of security. These tools have different reporting mechanisms. They have different policy checks. They've got different architectures in essence. So what organizations try to do is use the native tooling and then somehow stitch this information together using APIs or some sort of a, an abstraction SOC or SIM or visualization mechanism, but it's stitch work. So it's actually reducing an organization's risk clarity. When you're looking at multi-cloud, my personal view here is that the only way to provide effective security is to abstract the security function to an orchestrator layer from the underlying cloud service provider. So what do I mean by that? Well, instead of relying on the cloud native tools provided by that service provider and doubling up in two cloud environments, look at a tool that can integrate with both those cloud environments and provide all the core capabilities in a platform way that you need to consume. This whole term of platform is becoming more prevalent. I mean, you know, it may not be the case in all customers, but the majority of the organizations that I deal with are very focused on tool rationalization, cost reduction, vendor consolidation. And by having an abstracted security solution that can integrate with whichever cloud platform, with whichever compute form factor you use across all your major clouds and hybrid cloud as well, multi-cloud and hybrid cloud, becomes extremely valuable. Now, for many organizations that are on the single cloud journey, what I have found through experience is typically that changes to a multi-cloud journey. And the reason for that is core capabilities that are only available from a cloud provider that would potentially give an organization a business edge. So now the organization has to go and adopt an additional cloud provider, which means reoperation of skills, identifying of tooling, and then you know acquiring those skills, which are already rare, and then operationalizing the entire infrastructure takes a very long time. Whereas even if you're in a single cloud environment, if you're already you know, handling security as an abstraction layer through a platform-based approach, if you at any point decide to consume a second cloud provider capability, you just plug it in and you already have your policies and your frameworks in place. You already have your security yeah. controls in place and so forth. So that is my main recommendation around multi-cloud is look at abstraction to provide you with that security layer. So again, it's scalable and autonomous. Exactly, exactly. Okay. But, but, but with the advice and guidance from consultants like yourself. 100%, 100%. I think, you know, whenever we talk about cloud and standardization, automation is always at the top of mind, right? Because at yeah. the speed and scale of cloud, 
there's no chance that an organization will be able to remediate things in a manual fashion continuously. It's just, it's not feasible. Okay. I've got time for two more questions. Franz, are you, are you, are you still hot to trot? 100%. I'm ready to go. Wonderful. Thank you very much. What happens if I have workloads in both public cloud and my private cloud? Is it possible to protect a hybrid cloud environment using a single tool set? And I somewhat think that you've answered that. And my analogy that I have in my mind here is going back to our castle and the moat. There are a bunch of soldiers in the castle protecting it. Bring in some allies, fortify the different types of soldiers you've got. Maybe you need some cavalry. Maybe you need some artillery. Yes. The, the answer to that question is yes, you can. So you can use a single tool like Prisma Cloud that will allow you to cover all the various workloads inside the cloud. So your various modernized compute form factors, but also bare metal infrastructure that you could be hosting in your private environment or container platforms like, you know, OpenShift or Rancher. And all of this is supported through a single pane of glass capability for hybrid cloud workload security. The only distinguishing factor or differentiator there is, you know, when we look at things like CNAP, cloud native application protection platforms, there, part of the requirement is, you know, you want to do infrastructure as code scanning. You want to do posture management across your cloud environments. You want to do workload protection, network segmentation, and identity controls. Now, from a posture management point of view, this would not be possible with most tooling in a private cloud environment. And the reason is that private cloud does not have the actual APIs associated with the cloud provider that you're ingesting to gain that asset visibility, you buy and control. Unless you're running something like AWS Outposts within your private data center that has access to those APIs. But definitely from a workload protection perspective, from a DevOps security perspective, this is available for multi-cloud and hybrid cloud mixes as well as private data centers. Okay. If I am the CEO and I have to ask one question, knowing how important it is to secure our data, what are the major considerations and where do I start in ensuring that we remain ahead of the threat? From a cloud specific point of view? Cloud and the security of my data. Okay. Assuming my data is in the cloud. So the first thing to consider there, I think is, you know, back to basics. If we look at some of the core principles of cloud security, firstly, gain deep visibility, right? So you need to understand where those assets reside, those data assets what those data assets represent. So what is the content? Is it personal information, credit card information, whatever the case may be, potentially malware. And on top of that, you know, how does that relate to my governance framework? Now, once I've identified where that data resides, there's a couple of other things that I want to do. Now, the first, earlier in this conversation, I mentioned that when we talk about cloud, everything is API driven, correct? So when we talk about our storage environment, that set of API queries that does the configuration and implementation of that. And again, I can only access that data if I can access it. Right? And I, I know that term sounds extremely simple and, and stupid in essence, True. but what it means is if I have a storage bucket or a storage object repository in the cloud that is not publicly hosted, that is encrypted or not publicly accessible, that is encrypted, that is hardened, then the ability to access that becomes lower and lower. If I've set my permissions correctly, access becomes lower and lower, or my chance of access becomes lower. So from that standpoint, the first thing is you want to make sure that from a configuration point of view, your cloud resources are deployed in a way that's in alignment with best practices. So again, as I mentioned, make sure those stores are encrypted, make sure they're not publicly accessible, make sure there's versioning enabled, auditing enabled on that storage environment and so forth. And then from there on, you work your way up, linking it to standards like CIS benchmarks is a good starting point for that. So once you have visibility of the data, you've got visibility of the configuration hosting that data, and you have the surety that that is safe, that is, that is secure, then you want to start looking at behavior with that data store, right? So how are users behaving with that data store? Am I seeing something that I don't usually see? So more of a Uber and threat detection layer on top of that. Am I seeing IP communication to a service relying on that mounted store that is from a suspicious public network? And so we work up the stack, but the core tenants is you need to have visibility. You need to know where the data is, what it is. And the second is you need to make sure your configuration policies are correct to harden the instance hosting it. That sounds like a set of questions I should definitely have jotted down. And I will no doubt be needing to walk into a room full of people and reel them off out of my little black book. <laughs> but I didn't write them down. 
And on that note, one of the kind things that Francis put together for us is a pack that we're going to share with everyone after this call, which consists of three or four different key takeaway, different resources to go to. It, there's some research in there from foresters. There's a, a very interesting YouTube clip with some other interviews and questions that are being asked and some other guidance and points of direction to help us all unpack a lot of what we clearly are unable to comprehend as, as well as France has. But in turn, we will digest this and hopefully get to a point where we feel secure and protected and can associate ourselves with people like you and your team. So thank you, Franz. I think we, I've certainly learned a huge amount. It's a pleasure anytime. And I'd just like to encourage the, the listeners today, you know, if you, if in future you have any questions with regards to, you know, cloud, cloud security strategies, DevSecOps programs, if you just want guidance, or if you want to engage to understand what we do with Prisma Cloud and how we secure some of the largest organizations in the world from code to cloud, please feel free to reach out to me. I am available on LinkedIn. You will gain access to my contact details after this session as well. And I look forward to engaging with you. Thank you. Thank you, James, for your time also. Brilliant. And to all those listeners, there's a lot going on in this world at the moment. We're busy as hell and it's the end, wrapping up to the end of the year. But what we are doing is sharing as much information as we can, identifying some of the key trends that are happening in the industry, identifying some of the books that our senior leaders and specialists in our world are reading over the Christmas holiday while lying on a beach, but also preparing for some really exciting round tables that are going to happen in the first half of next year watch out for those invitations to follow and also the information we're going to share following this call with a link to share it with your other colleagues who haven't necessarily been able to join but would definitely learn from some fascinating insights so franz from you and your team thank you very very much i think if i if i and i know i do have the need to come to you we're definitely going to touch base and i've got a lot more questions to ask you just i think mostly to try and unpack some of those acronyms you've kindly shared with us but we'll get there. Thank you for educating us. Thank you for your time. And thank you for being so specific in your responses to us. I think it's been invaluable to myself, but also all the listeners. And from Tech Central side and me, James Erasmus, thank you very, very much, everyone. Love you, love you to have you on board. Cheers, Franz. Bye-bye.